Good morning. My name is uh, Linda Clausen. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, we want to make sure that we will get through the material in the 45 minutes allowed. Uh, I will stick around as long as uh, there are questions at the end. Uh, you can always get a hold of me at lclawson at themasync.com. This webinar will be recorded and reposted on our Themas uh, webpage. So if you go to themasync.com and look at webinars, you can always uh, replay it from there if you need to. So we are recording. Today we're going to talk about methods that you can use to minimize your trips to DB2. Now, if you have questions, there is an area in the control panel, uh, a questions area where you can post questions. Oh, somebody said the access code is bad. Did you use the, um, hmm, proper logon? Okay, very good. It's working now. Uh, you can post questions in the question area. And uh, we'll answer the questions as time permits. Any questions not answered, you can send me a direct email or send it to the uh, Themis Instructor email address. Either one, I will monitor each. And for extended performance, you can always look at uh, our ZOS perfor uh, database performance tuning class. This is a very small part of that training. Uh, the agenda today, we're going to take a look at how do we identify the threads with high DB2 entry and exit events. In other words, you're going back and forth to DB2 many times. We want to try to minimize that. If we can minimize the number of trips from your application to DB2 and back, we can reduce the CPU overall CPU wait time and CPU milliseconds. So we're going to take a look at the coding techniques to minimize these trips. We're also going to look at different ways of optimizing your coding for DBAT, for your distributed threads as well. And then we're going to take a look at uh, some of the SQL and bind options we can use to uh, optimize our multiple row access. Now, when we look at our application, our application according to DB2 tracing, the application uh, starts in DB2 at the initial thread allocation. So when you execute your plan and invoke your program to execute your package, when the thread is allocated, you're assigned a task control block, TCB, in DB2. From that point on, all your SQL, every one of the packages, your program, and if you call a stored procedure program package, you invoke a stored procedure or an external function, those are all captured as pro part of your application elapsed time in DB2. And that terminates that elapsed time application elapsed time is terminated and trace record is written when the thread is deallocated or the thread goes inactive if it's a reusable thread or your auth ID changes or you're performing roll-up for your kicks transactions and for those shared threads. So that is basically your application elapsed time. Now, the entry and exits to DB2 for that application elapsed time 
depends on how many times you have to go from the application for an SQL statement into DB2 and return, into DB2 and return. So what we want to do is minimize the number of statements to satisfy the requirement, okay, so that we leave the application as few times and enter, enter into DB2 as few times as possible. We want to go to DB2, get as much done, get everything we need, and return, perform return trips as few times as possible. Okay, now, to identify those threads, those long-running threads, those threads with high entry exits and long-running threads, there's various different ways to do that. Number one, your system programmer can set up, and part of the installation parameters, install parameters, we call them ZParms, okay, we have uh, thresholds we can set that kicks out messages for long-running readers. This is a, one that's been in there processing for a long time, okay, and for the long-running updaters. Those are the ones with the unit recovery. They have an issue to commit. So those messages can be um, monitored on the console. So we have those warnings. And that kind of gears us, gears us to the application plan that kind of needs to be taken a look, a look at. We need to do code reviews. We need to review your code. We want to minimize the number of SQL statements. We want to make sure you're not creating perform loops that are unnecessary. So we really do need those code reviews. And we need to use our accounting traces. Now, it doesn't have to be DB2PM. Any of your good monitors will gather the trace records. Okay? And we're going to look at those applications that have a high application elapsed time, that's class one time in your counting traces, and we're going to take a look at the class two in DB2 time trace entries to see the entry exit at the thread level, and then we're going to also, if you're gathering package level, look at the individual program package being executed and look at its entry exits. And you can get that with your class seven trace records, okay? So normally when you're setting up traces, you will set up your normal class one, class two, class three, class seven to take a look at these things. And you can look at your trace reports then. Okay, now, when we look at our traces, looking at those entry and exits, okay, taking a look at our application, class one, in DB2, class two times, there is an entry exit for this thread or set of trace records. And what we want to do is see the total number of entry exits and compare it in our performance report, our accounting report, trace report, to see if it's a one for one for the number of SQL statements executed. Now that means that you're doing single processing. For example, if you're inserting 10,000 rows and you see 10,000 row inserts, one row per each insert statement, you know you're doing singular, where that could have been a multi-row insert instead. The same thing with your cursors. If you see a high entry exit, you look at your read-only applications, you see a single open, you see for each fetch, the 10,000, and you're getting one row per fetch, then you know that you're not doing multi-row fetching. 
and then a single close. What we want to do is change that, that for one fetch, we can retrieve 100 rows or more per fetch into our array data types. And if it's COBOL, you know it occurs 100. Give me 100 rows at a time. To minimize the overall trips in and out of DB2. And this can significantly improve your performance. Now when you do code reviews, what you want to do is avoid unnecessary SQL statements. A lot of times I'll go through and look at the code and see that they're doing a singleton select and then performing a paragraph. In that paragraph they have a singleton select to get a piece of information and then they do a bunch of other SQL and then they perform that loop over and over where that singleton select could have been done once outside of the loop. Okay, so take a look at those perform loops. Is there embedded inside the loop something that could have been done once before the loop started? I also frequently see application joins, we call those stage three joins, instead of SQL joins. What you really want to do is strive for getting all of the data out of all of the tables in an efficient manner, in an efficient manner, in a single SQL statement. You don't want to be doing an open cursor, fetch one row, take that information, open another cursor, fetch the rows for that, and for each one of those rows you fetch, go to the next. I've seen archaic rules where we don't do more than a three table join. No, 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 no. I've done up to a 14 table join and gotten sub-second response time. Outperforming the application join. So those are things we want to look at. Also, strive to do output only updates and deletes. You have no idea how many times I go out there and see a select, is the row there? Okay, then update it or delete it. Uh, why don't you just put in the WHERE clause, the identifying information, and if it's there, it gets updated or deleted, output only, and DB2 will give you a not found condition if it's not there. Rather than going to DB2 to select it when you are just verifying it's there and going back. Ah, oh, that's a nice comment. I have 30 table join that gets sub-second response. That's right, single SQL joins. DB2 is meant to be asked for everything you want in one request. And like I said, why select it before you update it or delete it? If you're going to delete it, do an output only. If you're going to update it, do an output only. Now, there are exceptions. Once in a while, you have to get the current content for the update to make a decision. However, most of those I have found can be in the WHERE clause of the update statement. Okay. And I don't see enough row set processing. Using the capability, especially in our batch and KICS applications, CICS, COBOL programs, to use the row set processing. To ask DB2 to return 100 rows at a time, or to hand DB2 100 rows, we can use those COBOL arrays. We can use our curse clause and hand a block of rows to DB2 at a time. One entry into DB2 and one return. So those are the things you want to look at. We also don't take advantage enough in our code reviews to review of our extended indicator variables. Please remember every column can have an indicator variable whether the column is nullable or not. The indicator variable, when you're using it as a data value, 
passing to DB2 information is an indicator of DB2's action, not only to turn on the null condition, but also to tell DB2 the action you want it to perform on that column. So you want to try to use those indicator variables. You can set up a single static code, a single update statement or merge statement instead of having multiples. One update or insert that includes all columns each time instead of trying to create convoluted code. And then in your logic, you would set the indicator variable to tell DB2 the action you want to occur such as for updates and merges, if you put a negative 5 in the null indicator that you're providing in your variable, it's telling DB2, hey, I'm not sending you any content. Use the default value as whatever the default value is defined on the table. Or for your updates, you can set a negative 7 in that indicator variable and tell DB2, hey, ignore this column this time. All right? I'm not providing any data. Don't update it this time for the statement. I have nothing for it. And for inserts, you can use the negative 5 as well, or the negative 7, to use the default value at insert time. Now, you must bind with indicator variables, extended indicator variable, yes, or on your prepare statement, you say with it extended indicators. Okay. Now, for an example of that, here we have an insert statement. And the insert, now the intent is to have the insert provide all columns, okay, of the table. And when we're filling in the variables that contain the content, well, it just so happens this time, if input is not there, I'm going to move a negative 5 to the variable indicator variable for the address number 2, because we don't have an address 2 for this insert. Okay? So, whoops, come back here. So this time, When I pass DB2, the indicator variable is a negative 5. DB2 said there's no address, so use whatever the default value for the address column is. It'll use the default instead. There's no data content in the variable for the address, and it'll ignore it. It also minimizes transmission of information that's not there. So this doesn't get transmitted, just the indicator variable. Now, if I actually do want to change it, then I would prime it as a zero. Hey, there's data in address two. So that time during this update, the address will be provided. And the salary, there is no salary for the update. So it completely ignores this part of the update where it says set salary equal to the variable. Because the indicator variable says data content did not change. Skip the column. So making more intelligent code up front to transmit less data and having one common statement code that is easier to maintain and more stabilized. Now the other thing we can do to reduce entry access to DB2 and reduce our CPO and address space dispatching and everything at task control bus dispatching and everything else. To reduce the entry exit, use your row set processing. Use arrays. Okay? Do multi-row fetches. Do multi-row inserts. Okay? This will reduce the database calls. You can also use your merge, your upserts. This is the conditional. If it's there, 
update it. If it's not, insert it. And you can also use this with multi-row processing. Okay. The other thing, when you're doing inserts, updates, deletes, or emerge, instead of doing a select, for example, you want to insert and there's a generated key. Okay, can it be done using arrays with native SQL procedures? Yes, it can. So you can set up array data types in your native SQL procedures Uh, so they work. We have done that and remove unnecessary. Okay. Um, I'm having trouble seeing the entire question sometimes here. I'm trying to add. Upstart it, sir, it is emerge, by the way. Got to be a way to make this screen bigger for the questions. Okay. There was another one. How to, um, how about a set working storage timestamp, current timestamp versus including current timestamp instead of the host variable? in the next, uh, and seems like this would reserve, remove any unnecessary trips. <clears throat> Not sure what you're trying to get out there, sorry. Okay. I think I've caught up with questions now. Okay. We want to use, now, if you're going to do um, your multi-row processing, your row set positioning, row set processing, multi-row fetches, etc., you're going to have to get used to using the Git Diagnostics because if you're going to do multi-row inserts, you need to get, be able to continue if there is an exception on any one of the multiple rows you're inserting with one trip to DB2. Okay? So we're going to take a look at using those Git Diagnostics. Okay. And another thing we want to do, instead of doing a select after or a select before, if you need to look at the contents of an insert, update, or delete, or merge, you can use a select from the insert, okay, to get that information. Now, I've got some examples in here. For example, multi-row fetch. Instead of making 100 trips to DB2, you could make one trip to DB2. Exit your program into DB2 and pull back 100 rows at a time, for example. So you would t declare your cursor with row set positioning. Set up a variable for the number of rows you want to fetch at a time. And I'm just going to fetch 100. 100 seems to be a good number to me in most instances. Now, there will be exceptions to that, but 100 works pretty good. Go grab me 100 at a time. And then I'm going to fetch, after I open the cursor, I'm going to fetch the next row set from my cursor for whatever the number was that I put in my variable. And I'll bring that into my array. So I will have a column one array occurs 100 times, occurs 100 times, occurs 100 times. If you've got null indicator variable on one of those columns, occurs 100 times. 
and I bring back 100 at a time. Okay. Now, you will also need to make sure that you do have those, your work areas, occur 100 times. Because when you process through your array afterwards, you're going to have to have a scripting your capability. Okay. So an example. Now, what if there's less than 100 rows returned? Well, if your SQL code you, is 100, that means end of result set. You can set your end of flag, and then you will have a loop within a loop, okay? And you're going to perform the processing of the rows returned, subscripting your moves, okay? Or displays or whatever, I'm just doing a display until your return number of rows has been reached. Now you can ha find that return number of rows in your SQL communication area, in your third occurrence on a multi-row fetch. It will have the number of rows returned. So if it's less than a hundred, okay, you can stop your processing loop at that point. So, nice little handy variable to look at in your SQL communication area. Or you can get it out of your Git diagnostics. Now, multi-row inserts, you'd set up an array. You would populate the array. Tell DB2 how many you're going to insert. We're just doing 10. Taking a CICS screen and handing 10 rows to DB2 at a time. Then we're going to insert into the table our values from our array. Okay, for however many in our variable, our number of rows, not atomic, continue on exception. So if any one of the 10 rows has an error, the other nine goes in there. It doesn't abort the whole thing. It's not atomic. I will decide whether to commit or not at that point. Now, if I'm going to do that, and let's say I'm going to populate 100, so I can make a decision whether I want to do 100 trips or one trip to DB2 per 100 rows, okay? So insert processing can, and we have proven in through tracing, improve to performance significantly in the elapsed times. So hand it 100 rows at a time, two, instead of do 100 interrupts from application DB2, application DB2. Okay. Merge, you can do the same thing with a merge. Here, the standard way of doing it, we select, make a decision, if the SQL code is zero there, then we're going to do the update statement. Else, if it's plus 100, it's not found, then we're going to do the insert. Why go and do two trips to DB2 and process all of that if you can do a single merge? That's what an upsert is. That's what they call it, upsert. Update insert. A merge. Okay? When it's matched, it's the update. When it's not matched, it's the insert. We can also do multi-row. So I can provide my host variables, give names for the new item that we're putting in there. When it's matched, I'm going to do the update. When it's not matched, I'm going to do the insert. Not atomic, continue on exception. So if any one of the five rows that I'm going to conditionally either update or insert has an error, then I can handle the ex, uh, exceptions in the Git Diagnostics. 
and make sure then afterwards I decide whether I want to commit those or not. The ones that were successful gets committed or not. Now they get diagnostics. What you really need to do is you need to set up some working storage fields for or variables for the get diagnostic returned contents. Okay. This is a and one of the things we want to look at for just the statement level, I want to know the number of conditions that occurred. So let's say I'm doing a 100 row insert. After the insert, I want to do a get diagnostics at the statement level and find the number of conditions that were raised. These are your negative SQL codes, your oopses. Then I'll perform a loop to get those processes. So I'm going to perform varying a counter until the counter is greater than the conditions that were raised. So if I had Two SQL conditions, I'll perform this loop and get both conditions, gather the diagnostic information using the get diagnostic condition, all right, for whichever condition number it is, it's the first or the second or the third, okay, and I'll get the returned SQL code and whatever diagnostic information out of the diagnostic area into my areas and put that on my report or display it. So here I did a 100 row insert, I captured the conditions using get diagnostic, whoops, and then I can go ahead display those that had an error. This can eliminate a significant number of interactions between DB2 using the multi-row processing in your Git Diagnostics. Okay. That's correct. Now, the when you do your Git Diagnostics loop, it's in reverse sequence. It's the most current, which is, so if you're doing 100 rows, and you get an error on row 75 and 98. The get diagnostic, the first one in the perform loop is the condition for row 98 and the next one is your row 75 because it's a stack. It keeps a stack of diagnostics for any one of the multiple rows that had a diagnostic condition. So you get the top of the stack, which is the most recent. So it's in reverse order of they actually occurred. And you can actually capture your row numbers and, yeah, the DB2 row number, etc. That's why I kind of get the row number. And I get more information than those three, but you have to decide what you want. In fact, I have a tendency to capture the entire statement condition. and I throw it into an error table or MQQ, the entire 32K diagnostic condition area. Now, delete processing, now if you're doing single row, you know, where it's equal to unique key. Now, what about your multi-row deletes? Are you using a cursor? Or are you doing an output only with a search condition? An output only with a search condition to do a multi-row delete is faster. Please don't do delete all rows from table. Mass delete in that way. There's other ways of clearing out all the contents of a table better than that. You can use the truncate, which is similar to just doing a load replace with no input. Okay, uh, reorg discard 
is not necessarily a good way. That now it's my and Willie may be able to um, verify this. I think that's being deprecated in the future releases. Reorg discard for the reorg utility. But if you need to do all of the roads, it's better. My preference is doing a load replace with a dummy input. Boom. No logging overhead and the fastest way to do it. For multiple rows, I want output only deletes preferred. Okay. Delete processing. Now, what if you need to look at the updated content or want to look at the after effect of an insert, update, or delete? Let's assume you're going to insert into a table and it's a generated key and you want to see the key. Well, you can do a select from the final table of the insert or select from the final contents to get the updated content or the select from the final table to find out on your merge whether it was an insert or an update. Now, if you want to see the before contents, you can say select from old content on a delete or an update rather than select, then do the statement. See, with one trip to DB2, you can get what you need. It, it's too bad you can't do both, but one or the other, depending on your processing needs. For distributed, your DBAT threads, okay, you can, if all of the distributed for continuous block shipping, if not all the pieces are in place or you suspect it's not, you can influence DB2 to do block fetching for your distributed apps. Make sure it is a for fetch only cursor. Make sure your systems do have extra server blocks defined, at least 100. And then it's, you can optimize for a very large number of rows to get block shipping turned on, even though it may not, all the pieces between the front end and the back end server aren't set for block shipping. This will influence DB2 to block, do block shipping anyway. Okay. You can enable package-based continuous block shipping if you've got a DB2 for ZOS client and a DB2 for ZOS server to get that by doing the bind with the new protocol, DB protocol on your bind, DIRTA CBF. And that works because prior to this, block shipping, if it was a ZOS to a ZOS, DB2 to DB2, we couldn't get the block shipping in. Now we can't, which is nice. Okay. You can also use fetch first X number of rows to cause your distributed query to do a fast implicit close. Now, be careful that you're not cutting off. Okay? What you need. Take a look at the new version of 11 array data types. Because in native SQL procedures, now we can do arrays. Process an array. Reducing trips. And move as much SQL into maybe the, your native SQL procedures as you can away from the client. We have better control that way. And if it's a native SQL procedure, you have performance improvements. If you're doing all everything in the front end, get process, get back process, we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth across the network. And believe it or not, network profit, uh, traffic is one of our biggest problems in today's environment. I'll tell you right now, 
I am a bad user. I get upset if I don't get instant response. And I'll go shop somewhere else or do business somewhere else. So I don't want slow traffic, I want fast. And my preferred method is to use the stored procedures and native if possible, especially if it's a lot of it complex SQL and a little bit of very bit of little logic. Those make good native SQL procedures. So the front end can just call the procedure and it's much more secure. I did not touch you. You jumped on your own. Sorry about that. So I can reduce that, go once into DB2, let DB2 do its work. And in the native SQL procedure, make sure I'm using coding techniques so that the interaction between the stored procedure package and DB2 is efficient. Okay, so all the coding techniques we talked about in that native SQL procedure using multi-row, blah, blah. Okay. Now, external stored procedures, remember we have the external stored procedures that work in the workload manage address space. So we, if we're doing that, we connect, we go to DB2 database services, it, it asks workload manager to load in the stored procedure. If we call procedure, it's loaded in from the load library. And then the workload manage address space is dispatched for every SQL statement you need. And then we go back to database services and then back to finally through the distributed to DB2. Native is different. All of the logic and all of the code is in the native SQL procedure. So we run within the package. It's all bound into the package. And it runs inside the database services address space. No workload managed additional address space dispatching there. We're not, okay? So it's all inside the database manager. The other advantage is the shared memory between your distributed and database services. So that information is set up um, in a shared memory area above the bar so there's no movement between database services and the distributed when we're shipping the results back. Okay? And your distributed requests are zip eligible, which means that runs on a, the cheaper zip processors and that's not charged back to your license. So that's money in the bank, okay? Making your processing more cost effective. And all of these things are, plays a factor. Okay, now make sure your bind options are correct. <clears throat> Use the least restrictive isolation, curses, stability, you are dirty reads if possible. Um, current data, no. If your client is a DB2 for ZOS to DB2 for ZOS server, then make sure you choose the protocol for block shipping between them. Use your release deallocate, okay? And consider looking at your other concurrency, maybe current access resolution. You might say, hey, use the currently committed and for your read-only processing and keep on going. Don't wait for the outcome, okay? so you can reduce the lock overhead for your read processes. So some of the bind options. Review your binds at each release of DB2. Now one size does not fit all when it comes to the binds. And then if you implement these things, you can actually see your entry exits to DB2 and you verify this by rerunning your accounting traces by saying, hey, my entry access have reduced for the number of statements I'm executing. I've got one insert with multiple rows. I've got one update coming across that processed multiple rows, one statement, multiple rows. I've got a reduced number of fetches. Each fetch returning multiple rows. So the overall entry access has reduced. 
reducing CPU MIPS and service units, reducing address space to address space, dispatching those wait states. Now, I, I've got a little, couple sample runtime results here. I had a, a stored procedure that was invoked. It had a base table cursor. Uh, it um, went against the base table, opened the insert, <clears throat> fetched a row from the insert cursor, inserted it into the glare global temporary table. When it was all done, it opened the cursor against the declared global table and returned it. And very small volume of data and it ran 820 milliseconds. Now, this is a very small test. Now, extrapolate it by extending the volumes. This was just for, I think it was 100 rows. We turned around and rewrote it, used a mass insert into the declared global table, got rid of the one cursor, just select into, insert into, and put the math in the insert statement. That, and then we opened the cursor of the declare, declare global temporary table and returned it to the user. Now that reduced it down to 570 millis, milliseconds. Same volume on table. Both of these were the second recording to make sure all the buffer pools were primed. And then the third one is, hey, did we even need the declared global temporary table? We put everything in the cursor, definition. Reduced it down to 290 milliseconds. Just by looking at the logic, and what did they really want here? And putting a couple of math statements inside the cursor for the base table to return the what if analysis they were looking at instead of using the excessive overhead. So different things you can think about. Do I really need to do that? Is there a reason to do all that code? What's the simplest least number of statements? So to minimize, please review your long running units of work. Use your messages to get those guys that are long runners that are out there forever. Um, use your unit, long running unit to re recovery to see who's not doing their commits on a timely basis. Do your code reviews. Look at those loops. Avoid unnecessary SQL statements. Um, use ROSA processing wherever possible. And use your accounting traces. Look at those entry exit events. Compare to the SQL DML how many statements to know whether you're doing single row, retrieval, transfers, etc. when multiple could work, plus your overall performance. Okay? These are all critical. Now, any questions or you can open the chat for chat because it's open to all and everybody on the chat. Anything? It does. If you're going sequentially against the table, the row set processing has really reduced overhead in a lot of applications. We've seen, uh, I have seen a couple, anything from 20 to 40 percent reduction using uh, multi-row insert too. Oh. So what you want to do, just some recommendations, identify your threads, look at your long running units of work, look at the entry exits, hey get some standardized code reviews, and please 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 ban the word never and always. <clears throat> they always make a fool of me the next release of DB2 or the next requirement. Be creative, be proactive, be flexible, okay? Choose more than one solution whenever you're looking, hey, this is not going so well, I want to get it better. Test and implement. And like I said, never say never and never say always. It always comes back and bites me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
So we made it in the 45 minute requirement. Um, this is a very small little piece of our performance classes. Uh, if you want to follow us, you can. Take a look. Uh, this webinar, as I said, is being recorded and we will post it with the rest of our webinars out on our webpage, webinar webpage out at uh, themasync.com. So I want to thank you. Nice group. And uh, please keep in touch. Anytime you want to ask questions, you can get a hold of me personally at lclawson at themasync.com. And I want to thank you for attending today. Is there any unanswered questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.